Em nome da Comissão Organizadora do Colóquio e do INPA, eu quero dar as boas-vindas a todos a esse 25º Colóquio. É, é um prazer ter vocês todos aqui. Eu quero lembrar que hoje, às 19 horas, nesse auditório vai ter a cerimônia de abertura oficial. E após a cerimônia vai haver uma pequena e singela recepção, uma taça de vinho. É, eu quero lembrar também que vocês receberam... Na, na bolsa, um formulário em que nós pedimos a opinião dos participantes sobre o colóquio e as suas sugestões. Quero pedir que gastem dois minutos preenchendo o formulário mais, mais na frente na semana e coloquem na urna que está tá colocada na, na saída de, do, desse auditório aqui. E agora eu vou passar a palavra ao professor Rosenberg, que é o presidente dessa sessão e que vai apresentar o primeiro conferencista. Ah, obrigado. Eu sou muito contente de apresentar a vocês uh, o professor Richard Schoen. Ele recebeu seu doutorado na Universidade de Stanford em 1967. Ele teve dois diretores de tese, verdade, Leon Simon e S.S. Yao. Uh, os dois estavam uh, recentemente uh, contratados na Universidade de Stanford. Leon Simon teve uma, um ano e meio mais que Rick e Yao uh, seis anos mais que Rick. Parece que antes de encontrar Simon e Yao, Rick pensei fazer a teoria dos números. O professor Schoen tem feito contribuições maiores nas áreas de geometria diferencial, uh, análise não linear, cálculo de variações e teoria de relatividade. Ele já recebeu o prêmio MacArthur e o prêmio Boucher. Na minha opinião, os artigos de Rick Schoen são os mais uh, citados na minha área. Agora vou apresentar Rick, que vai falar do o problema de Yamab e a teoria de relatividade. Uh, hello, can you hear me? Uh, <clears throat> okay, so uh, thank you very much for the invitation, Harold. I, I can understand very little of it, but uh, it sounded good. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> I thank Marcello for inviting me to this uh, meeting. It's been, a, it's been a long time since I've been at IMPA, and um, uh, I'm very much looking forward to uh, renewing old friendships, with people that I haven't seen for a long time. So it's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, <clears throat> so um, I'm going to uh, describe uh, uh, some work related to the Amabi problem, which is a problem that I've been interested in for a very long time. Um, <clears throat> in, in particular, I want to sort of generally uh, uh, describe what's been done on the problem and, and uh, describe the problem generally, and then I want to talk about some very recent work which uh, solves an old conjecture which goes back to the late 80s. Um, and I, I probably I won't have so much time to uh, give details, but let, let me just motivate the subject in the following way. So um, <clears throat> if you remember, a very basic theorem in two-dimensional geometry um, <clears throat> is that if we take a, a, a compact, uh, say, oriented Riemannian surface, then they fit into three categories. Um, uh, the genus zero, genus one, and genus greater than one case, depending on whether they admit um, uh, uh, spherical, flat, or uh, hyperbolic metrics. And in particular, um, one can state this theorem, um, one, one can state this theorem in the following way. So if you take any given background metric, G zero, so it can be a very, an arbitrary metric, then, um, um, th there's, there's a, one can always find a smooth function uh, so that the background metric can be uh, conformally changed. Uh, is there a pointer? Uh, um, oh, okay. Right. So that the, um, uh, one can always find a smooth function so that the 
by conformal deformation of the background metric, one can achieve constant curvature. And the constant depends on which of the three types of surface one has. Um, and a lot of geometry, a lot of problems in geometry actually have to do with trying to generalize this theorem to higher dimensions. And the Yamabe problem is no exception. So it uh, proposes a higher dimensional version of this theorem. And um, in particular, it um, it's, uh, can be described as a variational problem. And um, it's a very, um, a very classical one. Namely, uh, given a smooth manifold M of dimension now greater than or equal to 3, uh, one considers the variational integral, which is uh, given a metric, one computes its total scalar curvature. So um, the scalar curvature, um, of course, for two-dimensional metrics is the Gauss curvature. But in higher dimensions, it's, um, it's the full trace of the curvature tensor. So it's, it's the sum of all the sectional curvatures, if you like, in a basis. Um, so that's called the scalar curvature function. And if we, if we look for critical points of this uh, variational problem, sometimes called the Einstein-Hilbert uh, uh, energy or action, if we, if we consider critical points on the unit volume metrics, then it's an easy calculation that um, the uh, critical points are, in fact, uh, Einstein metrics. So they're Riemannian positive definite Einstein metrics. So they satisfy the equation that the Ricci curvature is proportional to the, uh, to, to the metric G. C is some constant. It's sort of like an eigenvalue. So you can think of it as a kind of nonlinear eigenvalue problem. Um, <clears throat> and on the other hand, um, it's a very atypical variational problem in that if you study its linearization about your favorite critical point, such as a flat torus or a standard sphere, you'll find that, in fact, um, this functional is neither minimized nor maximized. In fact, it, it, it tends to be minimized in, in conformal directions, and it tends to be maximized in transverse directions. So this is up to finite dimensional uh, spaces. So this is, a, this is a, a functional which has, which is a sort of infinite saddle. It's an infinite dimensional saddle in both directions, the critical points. Any critical point will have that property. So in particular, this suggests separating the conformal problem from the transverse problem. And in fact, usually what people refer to as the Yamabe problem is the conformal part of this problem. And in fact, that's what my lecture will deal with. Um, so, um, so this is very analogous to the two-dimensional uh, theorem that I described. Namely, given a, given a background metric G0 on a manifold now of dimension greater than or equal to 3, uh, the problem is to find critical points of this functional, R, uh, the total scalar curvature, uh, on the space of unit volume metrics. And uh, again, it's an easy calculation that uh, a critical point, if it exists, is no longer Einstein, but it, it satisfies the equation which I, I've called CSC, which is constant scalar curvature. So the, so the uh, conformal Yamabe problem has critical points which are constant scalar curvature. So in two dimensions, this is just constant Gauss curvature, but in higher dimensions, there are many metrics of constant scalar curvature which are not of constant sectional curvature or not Einstein. So this is... Um, a fairly a large, one expects it to be a large class of metrics. And in particular, one hopes that in a given conformal class, you can understand the uh, constant scalar curvature metrics in a, in a reasonable way. And so um, this problem has a uh, PDE formulation, which I've written down here. Namely, if you, um, if you write the uh, unknown metric G as a function, and it, it's convenient to write it in, in this sort of funny looking way, uh, times the background, then then this um, then this uh, scalar curvature functional, uh, the total scalar curvature takes a very nice form. It's it's a constant times a very classical looking energy function. So the the energy of u is is a kind of Dirichlet energy. So it's it's the integral of gradient u squared with respect to the background plus a constant times a uh, quadratic term in u. So it's the the background scalar curvature times u squared. And in particular, this is the energy form associated to a very important operator, which uh, plays a really important role in, in the subject. And this is called the conformally invariant Laplacian. So it's the Laplacian relative to the background minus a fixed constant C of n, which I've written there, times the background scalar curvature times u. So this operator has a, a, a natural conformal invariance, as the Laplacian does in two dimensions. Uh, and um, it's, it plays a very basic role in the theory. 
And so the, the volume of the manifold, of course, since we've written the uh, metric G is U to a power times the background, the volume is just some LP integral. It's the integral of U to this important power, 2 n over n minus 2, uh, integrated with respect to the background. And then the CSC equation becomes this uh, um, relatively simple looking uh, PDE. So the linear part is just L of U, and, the, and then there's a constant C times U to this power, n plus 2 over n minus 2, which is 1 less than that power. And one is looking for positive solutions of that problem. So the, this Yamavi problem can be formulated as, a, as a, um, a PDE problem in this way. And now uh, I want to say something just a little bit technical, um, uh, just, just, just to describe sort of the, the, uh, the approach that we're using. In fact, it was also the approach that was originally used by Yamabe around 1960. So Yamabe recognized that in this problem, um, a major difficulty arises because uh, that exponent that appeared in the, um, in the equation um, is a critical exponent. So I had the equation here. <clears throat> so the exponent uh, n plus 2 over n minus 2 is, is a critical exponent. So the, the problem with that exponent is conformally invariant. And this allows certain types of blow up to occur, which actually can't occur if you lower the exponent even by epsilon. Okay? So Yamabe realized that this problem would be a lot easier to solve if we lowered that exponent a little bit. Okay? So, so he formulated these approximating problems, which, um, <clears throat> so this is really, a, a, if you like, a technical scheme for solving the problem. Um, he, uh, he proposed this um, so-called subcritical regularization. So, so uh, this critical exponent P, I've called now P star. And so he proposed looking at exponents which are slightly smaller, so bigger than 1 but less than or, e less than or equal to P star. And then, uh, and then one can formulate a perfectly analogous problem. One can then normalize the, um, so the volume term looks now like u to the P plus 1 uh, integrated as 1. And then one again looks for critical points of this energy. And then the Euler-Lagrange equation is uh, the same equation now, but with a power which could be lower than, uh, than P star. And now the important point is that for P less than P star, this problem is a very nice variational problem. So it, it fits into uh, a class of problems which is called the pelle smale problem, or it satisfies condition C, Pelle and Smale. And so one can produce critical points using Morse theoretic techniques. So one can produce minima, but one can also produce saddle points under various, various conditions. Okay, so, so for P less than P star, this is a very nice problem. And so then the, the, the critical analysis comes down to the question of whether solutions of the subcritical problem converge as, you, as P approaches critical. Okay, so that's the basic question. And the question of whether that happens or not is really a blow-up question. So it's, it's a question of whether, whether as P approaches critical, solutions can disappear uh, in some way or, or whether they necessarily converge. So it comes down to, if you like, proving suitable estimates on solutions which are independent of P, independent of the exponent. Okay, so um, in order to motivate the, uh, the, uh, the basic idea behind the Yamabe problem, let me go back to the two-dimensional case. So um, let me digress back to two dimensions. So, so um, let's suppose I'm in the genus zero case. So actually I should say that that the Yamabe problem was solved a long time ago for, um, for metrics of zero and negative scalar curvature, the only hard case in the Yamabe problem. And in that case, solution's unique. There's a, a kind of convexity for the problem so that solutions are unique. So the, 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 the case that I'm going to talk about is strictly the positive case. Okay? So in, in two dimensions, that corresponds to the genus zero case. So let me describe a, a way of um, almost explicitly or really in terms of solving a linear equation and then a system of ODEs to, um, to produce a, um, to solve the problem in the genus zero case that I described, the, the uniformization problem. Okay, so, and and this, is, this is very much analogous to what we're doing in higher dimensions. Okay, so, so the idea uh, in two dimensions is, well, we know that if we take the sphere, then, well, that's sort of not very complicated, but it's a little complicated. But if you remove a point from the sphere, then you can, you can stereographically project this, the uh, sphere minus a point to R2. And then, and then the Euclidean geometry is, is then conformal to the 
standard geometry on the sphere. So, <clears throat> so the idea of this, this particular proof is to do an analogous thing for a general metric. Okay? So suppose we, suppose we start with a, a background metric uh, on M, which is our G naught, and then we're going to remove a point. So we take M and remove a point, and then we'll construct a metric G bar on this non-compact manifold, which is uh, complete and flat and simply connected. Okay? And the way we can do that is by solving a linear equation. So I haven't written it down, but the, the linear equation looks something like this. So you take, <clears throat> you take the, the background Laplacian and then minus one half the background Gauss curvature is equal to uh, two pi times a delta function at p. So, <clears throat> so th this is a, a perfectly good linear equation relative to the background metric. So given the point p, one can construct a solution singular at p, so this is the Dirac delta function, and the weighting here is chosen so that the, the integral of the right-hand side, uh, sorry, minus, <clears throat> is the integral of the left-hand side in the gauss bonnet theorem. And then if one takes this v and, and constructs the metric e to the 2v times g naught, this metric actually has curvature of identically zero. So this is a, the, so, so what we've done is we've solved the linear equation singular at a point, and we've produced a metric which is flat and complete. Okay, so you have to, to prove completeness, you have to analyze the, uh, the, uh, the pole, uh, the singularity at, the, uh, at, at P, but it's not difficult to do that. And, and so in this way, one produces this metric, which on the slide I've denoted G bar. That's my, my metric G bar. Okay, so simply by solving a linear equation, I can construct a metric on M2 minus a point, which is complete, flat, and simply connected. Okay, and therefore, we know from basic geometry that there's only one such manifold up to isometry, namely R2. So, in fact, one could produce the Euclidean coordinates on R2 by integrating its systems of ODEs, integrating ODEs, really, if you like. So this is more, more or less, not quite explicit, but more or less. Okay, so this... Uh, uh, so this, this metric is actually isometric to R2. And then in terms of Euclidean coordinates, we can simply write down the spherical metric. So we now have R2. We have Euclidean coordinates. We can simply write down the standard spherical metric. And in that way, we solve the problem. Right? So we've shown that the original metric is conformal to the round sphere. Okay? So that's, a, that's a, a very explicit proof of the uh, uh, uniformization theorem in the genus zero case which we're going to generalize to higher dimensions. This is actually, it's not a, it, of course, very far from the original proof of this theorem. But um, <clears throat> I mention it because what we're going to do in higher dimensions is precisely analogous. Okay, so, um, so as I said, we're only going to consider cases where the scalar curvature is positive. Uh, <clears throat> and these are, this is a class, this is a, uh, a condition, it's actually a conformally invariant condition on the conformal class. It's, it means that the Imabi invariant is positive, if you like. Uh, and then we're going to consider the operator L, which I've described. Okay, now since R0 is positive, this is a negative definite operator. And so I can do something very much like what I did in the surface case. If I choose a point on my manifold, then I can, there, there's a um, unique up to scale positive Green's function for L with pole at that point. Okay, I've denoted it G sub P. So um, L of G is, is minus a delta at P. And then I can look at this as a Riemannian metric. So I take M minus the point and I look at that metric. So now this metric is complete. One can, again, do the asymptotics to check that. It's actually asymptotically flat. So uh, this, again, is, is sort of a, it's an, it's an analog of stereographic projection. So it takes, stereographic projection takes the spherical metric to the flat metric. So, so this metric is not flat, but near infinity it approaches the Euclidean metric. So it, it's a, an example of a metric which is called asymptotically flat. So near infinity, it, it, the curvatures go to zero at a certain rate. And, uh, and the, uh, the curvature equation it satisfies is that it's scalar flat. So it has zero scalar curvature. So it's no longer flat, it's only scalar flat. So this, makes it, th this, of course, makes a huge difference because in higher dimensions, there are many, many metrics of zero scalar curvature which are asymptotically flat and, and not flat. I mean, th this metric won't be flat unless the original manifold is a standard sphere. 
Okay, so that's the point. Um, <clears throat> okay, so in, in fact, this class of metrics is very widely studied in relativity. So these are examples of uh, <clears throat> initial data for the vacuum Einstein equations. So remember that the, in relativity, the vacuum Einstein equations are a system of wave equations. So one specifies initial data on a three-dimensional manifold, and so one uh, specifies the initial position and the initial velocity of the uh, four-dimensional, of the four metric, really. And um, th this, uh, th this is precisely a solution of the vacuum constraint equations, which is what's called time symmetric. So what that means is that the initial velocity is zero. So, so, there's, so one has only the initial metric and not the initial time derivative. And, um, and so in particular, there are things known about solutions, about e metrics like this. There's some, some intuition which comes from relativity. Okay, and the key thing for my talk is what's called the positive mass theorem. So this is a theorem that Yao, Yao and I proved in, the, uh, in about 1979. And um, so, um, so, the, um, so there's a, a very general theorem about, about metrics like this. Um, however, the theorem depends on having good asymptotics for the metric. So as I said, the metric is close to Euclidean near infinity. And if you assume the asymptotics are particularly nice, so this is, so the leading order term in the asymptotics here is, is radial. <clears throat> and I've written it in this, in this form. So I've written it this way because this uh, leading order term here is, um, uh, is what's called the Schwarzschild metric in relativity or the, the higher dimensional generalization of that. <clears throat> the Schwarzschild metric is the, the gravitational metric which corresponds to a point mass or a, a black hole static black hole in, in, in relativity. So if you assume the metric has asymptotics like that, and if you assume the scalar curvature is non-negative, then it implies that this term, which, which uh, is called the, uh, the total mass, the ADM mass of the system, uh, is actually always positive, and it's only zero, can only be zero if the uh, manifold is isometric to Rn. Okay, so there's this very special characterization. Um, there's this special term in the asymptotics, which uh, which, uh, which occurs here. And now if, if my manifold, if the manifold I looked at here came from uh, removing a point from a compact manifold, then the mass term appears here in, in this form. It's just a change of coordinates. So the, if we take the Green's function, we, we expand it. It has a top order term, which is always uh, mod x to the 2 minus n. That's the um, Newtonian potential term. And then, there's a, and then there's a constant term. That constant term is m and then plus low order terms. So if G has an expansion like this, then the corresponding metric, um, asymptotically flat metric, will have this expansion in suitable coordinates, and, and then we, you know, the mass is defined and we have this, this theorem. As I said, the physical idea is that um, um, <clears throat> uh, solutions of the Einstein equations of this type correspond to um, um, finite systems or isolated systems. So, these are, these are sort of some, some collection of gravitating objects, and then you assume that everything else is infinitely far away. So the gravitational field then from far away decays to the, uh, uh, the uh, Minkowski space, and if you look at the, this inhomogeneous stuff from far away, it looks rotationally symmetric. So just like in Newtonian gravity, if you take a finite mass distribution, if you look at it from far away, it behaves like a point mass right, centered at, at the center of mass. So this is the same idea. So, so this, um, <clears throat> this leading order term is, is the n-dimensional version of the Schwarzschild metric. And um, as I said, that, <clears throat> that is the, the relativity analog of a, um, uh, of a point mass. Okay, so, um, so now given the positive mass theorem, let me describe the existence of uh, a minimizer for the Imabi problems. This work goes back to the mid-'80s. Um, Okay, so um, <clears throat> so the, the existence of the minimizer was done in the following way. So one considers the enthemum, uh, which I've denoted E underlined here. Okay, so we're trying to achieve that enthemum. Um, and um, one compares that number. So that's actually, that's a conformal invariant. It's called the Yamabe invariant of the, of the class. And um, we're going to compare that number to the number we get for the standard sphere. Okay, and it, it turns out by theorems that have been known since the 60s, um, 
the standard metric on the standard sphere realizes the infimum. It's a theorem of Obata. Uh, and so we know what this number E1 is. This is the uh, infimum for the standard sphere. It's a, it's a numerical constant, depending on the dimension, depending on n. Um, OK, and then, and then now if I do this process of removing a point and uh, blowing up, then I get two cases, right? Well, the first case is sort of trivial. It could happen that when I, re when I take m and remove a point, this manifold is actually isometric to Rn, right? So that happened in two dimensions, but it doesn't generally happen in higher dimensions, right? So this would only happen in higher dimensions if the manifold is conformal to the standard sphere. So that's, that, that case occurs very rarely. Typically, what will happen is that this um, manifold uh, is not isometric to Rn, and so it will have positive mass. Now, using the fact that the mass is positive, uh, it's possible to do a, a kind of asymptotic calculation to show that this, uh, this number E lower bar there is strictly less than E1. Okay? So it, it turns out that the mass term provides an, a, uh, a term which measures the deviation from, from E1. And, and that's the key thing. Once you get below this E1, then it was known for um, more than 10 years through work of, um, of uh, Trudinger and O'Ban that one can derive uniform estimates independent of P on those subcritical problems. So in, in more modern terminology, we would say that, we would say that uh, the, 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 the infimum of the energy is less than one bubble. Okay, so this is one of those problems that um, where the, the blow-up can only occur in quanta of energy. Okay, so so there's the, the lowest energy blow-up corresponds to a bubble, uh, the, the manifold looking like a bubble. And then one could have multi-bubble blow-up as well. But for, for minima, one only needs to consider um, uh, one bubble. And, and if one can prove that the uh, infima of the energy is strictly below E1, there simply isn't enough energy to blow up. Okay, and so one gets the uniform, uniform estimates for the minimizer. So that's, that, that was the um, way that worked. However, <clears throat> I've lied to you in, in this. It, this looks nice and all that, but it isn't really quite true because, because actually, <clears throat> if you look at these manifolds, you take a, a general manifold of dimension n minus a point with this metric g bar, <clears throat> then um, in general, this manifold doesn't have a mass. So, so um, in order to define the, the, uh, uh, the mass in relativity, you have to have sufficient asymptotics to the uh, Euclidean metric. And in high dimensions, in particular in dimension 6 and above, there's simply, in any coordinate system, there just is not good enough asymptotics. So, so there are additional terms that come in that beat out the mass in the, in the high dimensional case. So, so the general situation is that the argument I described works uh, but only in dimensions 3, 4, and 5 in general. Okay, so, so actually one can work a little bit and show that the ADM mass is well-defined precisely in, in those dimensions in general. And uh, if, if one takes a manifold of high dimension, that is 6 or above, then the, the condition required for the mass to be defined at a point is that the vial curvature tensor, so, that, so if you remember your geometry, the, the, the vial tensor is the part of the curvature tensor which measures conformal flatness of the metric. So if you ask the question, can you conformally deform the metric to a flat metric, the answer is no in general. And the obstruction is measured by the, the vial curvature, the vial part of the curvature. And so what one needs to define the mass is that the vial vanishes to order L bigger than n minus 6 over 2. So it's possible to analyze uh, very precisely the, uh, um, the condition required to, uh, to uh, define the mass. Okay, so, um, so now uh, for the minimizing, min minimizers for the Imabi problem, however, it happened that the case n greater than or equal to 6 and w not identically 0 had already been done about 10 years earlier by Oban. So there was a separate argument which, which uh, treated those. And so in particular, that, um, that, uh, um, that, that was, that's the outline of the, so the existence of minimizers for the Imabi problem. However, I should also mention that that there's, there's also a, um, something to be said about the positive mass theorem. Because, because actually, the proof that Yao and I gave for the positive mass theorem only works for manifolds of dimension less than or equal to 7. Whereas a, a, a year or two later, there was a proof given by Witten, which uses spinners. 
And that proof works in all dimensions, but it only works for spin manifolds. Okay? So there's, there's a little caveat in high dimensions about, about the positive mass there. I'll say more about that. Now, in the case of, um, in the case of minimizers, um, <clears throat> we got around that by proving the positive mass theorem separately in the locally conformally flat case. And so it turns out there's some rather interesting analysis of locally conformally flat metrics, which, which implies the positive mass theorem and more. So in high dimensions, we, um, uh, Yao and I, in about 85, gave a separate positive mass theorem argument. So that, that gave all of the, that proved the required positive mass theorem for, for the full, uh, for all of the cases uh, for constructing minimizers for the Amabi problem. And I should also mention that, um, um, in, in fact, in this, uh, in this second theory, result I mentioned here, there's an important role played by a particular coordinate system in the theory, which is developed by Lee and Parker, so-called conformal normal coordinates. So, so, so obviously, how good the asymptotics are may, I mean, depends to some extent on how good a coordinate choice you make. And so there's, a, there's some special coordinate systems that were discussed by Lee and Parker, particularly in connection with this problem. Okay, so um, so that's the um, so that's an old story, really, but I, I thought it was worth uh, describing it in, in detail. Um, so um, so that's that's a summary of the um, the existence of um, of minimizers. But let me now do let me now look at three examples. Okay, so these are these examples are intended to um, well the first example is one that one all, one always has to discuss in any talk on the Imavi problem, namely it's the standard sphere. So so um, <clears throat> if you look at the standard sphere, I, I've already said that, that in fact the standard metric minimizes the Imavi problem. In fact, in fact what's true is much more. The, the, the theorem is that all critical points of the problem are in fact constant curvature metrics. So, uh, so in fact you can, you can understand for the standard sphere all solutions. The Imavi problem, they're all constant curvature metrics. Of course there's a non-compact family of constant curvature metrics. Um, in, in, in the conformal class, for, for example, if you, if you think of the spherical metric on Rn, you can, it's rotationally symmetric about a point, so you can choose the center, and there's also a dilational scale that, that you can choose. So in fact, the space of solutions is actually a non-compact space. It, it's sort of convenient to think of it as the hyperbolic n plus 1 space. So there's a non-compact moduli space of solutions for the standard sphere. And, and um, but because of the, the theorem that we're hoping to prove, this should be the only case where the moduli space is non-compact. Right? We expect that for any manifold different from the standard sphere, um, there should only be a compact set of solutions. Um, okay, and, and let me mention another example which can be um, where the critical points can be understood in terms of ODEs, in terms of uh, an ODE problem. And, and it's a, an example which illustrates some very interesting behavior. Namely, if you consider uh, the circle of length L crossed with a um, unit n minus 1 sphere. We call that, that that's actually a one parameter family of conformal manifolds. So I'll index it by L, the length of the circle, call that M sub L. It, it turns out that the, the behavior of the solution space depends very much on L. Okay, so when L is small, there's actually a unique solution, which is the product metric. So there's an obvious solution, which is just the, um, the product metric on S1 cross standard metric on Sn minus 1. So uh, in that case, there's a unique solution. But when you increase L past certain critical levels, more and more solutions pop up. So there's a, there are bifurcation points that occur for this problem. Uh, there are infinitely many. And if you take L very large, you get, you get a very large number of solutions. And in fact, you can sort of visualize these solutions for L very large as what I've called here beaded necklaces. So you can imagine you can imagine taking the spherical metric and removing two points, uh, antipodal points, and joining it to another uh, neighboring spherical metric by a small mech, and then following that around. And, and uh, one can produce uh, exact solutions, metrics of constant scalar curvature on um, these manifolds for L very large, which look very much like that for as many, as many beads as you like. Um, and then I should mention that there's a general theorem about um, multiplicity of solutions, which was done by Dan Pollock in his thesis in the early 90s. And so uh, Dan showed that if you take, um, if you take any manifold 
uh, with metric G naught, then given any number n, you can you can perturb the background metric by just a little bit in a weak norm though. In well, I said C1. Dan claims he only proved C0, but um, you can you can perturb the metric a little bit so that the uh, for the nearby metric, the uh, the number of solutions is bigger than n. Okay, so. So, so it's a very so so it, so in a weak topology, there's there's a, there's a dense set of metrics of positive scalar curvature where there are as many solutions as you like. So if you want more than a thousand solutions, I can perturb the metric on S3 to produce it, you know, just just a little bit. So so it's so it's a very complicated. So the, the structure of solutions for the problem is extremely complicated. In general, there are, there are, it's a high multiplicity of solutions. And so one of the projects that I Worked on intensively in the late '80s was to um, <clears throat> try to try to understand sort of the Morse theory for this uh, problem. In particular, to try to prove that the um, uh, that all solutions of the subcritical problem actually converge as um, as uh, p goes to critical. Um, and in fact, I have done that. I did that in various cases in in um, cases where the mass made sense. And I'd like to announce a general theorem here, which is um, a joint work with Marcus Curie. And we've, we've been able to, to finally do this, uh, this problem generally. So if you take any background metric in manifold in any dimension, if you assume the manifold is not conformally the standard sphere, then there's a uniform constant which bounds all solutions. So u is bounded above and below. You can bound derivatives of solutions for any solution u of the subcritical and for any p up to critical. So in other words, except for the standard sphere, we proved, we proved general compactness. So um, as I say, I, I, I had so a couple of remarks. First of all, there's, there's, no, there's no a priori uh, energy bound which is assumed on solutions. So in fact, the theorem implies one. So, so you know, often estimates depend on some bound on the energy. This particular one is very special. And in fact, you get uniform estimates which don't depend on, which uh, depend only on the conformal class, not on not on energy. And so let me just say that <clears throat> I conjectured this in 88. And um, I proved special cases. In fact, actually, the last time I was in Rio, I think, was 88 or 89. And in the talk I gave here, I talked about the locally conformally flat case of this theorem. So, so it's sort of natural. <laughs> 17 years later, I finally uh, made some progress. Um, so uh, so, the, the, so I, I had done the locally conformally flat case, but that was by a somewhat special argument that used the, uh, the, the theory for locally conformally flat manifolds, the developing map theory. And, and I also had done the n equals 3 case, um, and, and in fact, at least sketched an argument for n equals 3, 4, and 5, where the, where the mass can be defined. So recently, the n less than or equal to 5 case was uh, done by Drouet. And <clears throat> I should say that the the sort of first difficult case where, where the vial tensor enters uh, was done uh, quite also quite recently, n less than or equal to 7, in all n if the vial tensor is nowhere 0 by Fernando Cota Marquez. And there's some independent work which is, uh, which is slightly weaker by, by uh, Lee and Zhang also. OK, so um, I'm going to just talk very, very generally about the proof. But be, before I do that, so l let me just say that um, uh, a consequence of this theorem is that, is that one, can, one can derive Morse inequalities on, on solutions, at least in non-degenerate cases. So with some effort, it's possible to show that a, an open dense set of conformal classes uh, for an open dense set, all solutions, all critical points are non-degenerate. So that, that's not a completely trivial theorem, but it is. It, it, it is true. Um, <clears throat> so if you assume that the metric is generic, then you can prove relations among critical points, uh, which I've indicated here. And generally, there's a <clears throat> there's a uh, a degree count. So so if you if you sum uh, all the solutions with the sign depending on the evenness or oddness of the Morse index, you get you get one. If it's, it's a sort of Lyrae Schauder type type degree. Um, and so I, I won't emphasize this, but using that the theorem, as you can imagine, you can <clears throat> you can extend the some of the Morse theoretic results for the subcritical case to the critical case. You can't you don't you can't really extend the flow as far as I know, but you can at least st extend statements about 
relations among Morse indices of critical points. Okay, so let me just say that, let me give the key, the key new theorem here. So as I say, the, the outline of the, the proof of the theorem was, a, was around for a long time, but there was a key ingredient missing, which I, I also conjectured and even had some partial proofs, but I wasn't able to finish it. Um, this is uh, what I've called here the vile vanishing theorem. So, so uh, this is a theorem which, uh, which actually generalizes Oban's theorem in a, in a very strong way. Namely, if you, <clears throat> if you take a manifold, if you take dimension six or above, and you consider just a local metric defined on the ball. So think of the unit ball in Rn, uh, and just take any smooth metric, sufficiently smooth metric defined on the ball. And <clears throat> uh, so this is the unit ball centered at zero in Rn. Now assume that for this metric G0, you have a sequence of solutions, just local solutions. So there's no boundary condition. This is a purely local theorem. So you have a sequence of solutions, positive solutions, which, which blow up but are bounded away from the origin. So the origin is an isolated point of blow up. So, <clears throat> so there's a sequence. So one can show that the PIs have to tend to the critical to do that. But, okay, so suppose the solutions blow up, but if, if you remain, if you stay epsilon distance away from the origin, then they're bounded. Uh, then the, the conclusion is that the background metric G has, van has vial curvature which vanishes to the correct order. Namely, it vanishes to order bigger than n minus six over two. So it means the, the norm of the vial tensor at x is less than a constant times absolute x to the L, where L is bigger than that. Okay, so, so, another, so you can see the importance of this theorem in the general theory. It's saying that even locally, if you have a point of blow up, the vial tensor has to vanish to a sufficiently high order that the mass can be defined. Okay, and so that makes it possible to carry over the more global arguments involving the mass to this, to this setting. <clears throat> and so, so, so this is the really the main new theorem in the, in the paper. In particular, the, the work relies on uh, work by uh, Coda, which I, I mentioned, some more precise description of the solution. We improve a theorem of his, which, and it also relies on some work of Chen and Lin, which was done during, during the 90s. So, um, so that's, that's really the main, um, uh, the main new theorem. And I'll, I'll, I'll just very briefly... Uh, if I get a chance at the end, indicate um, technically how that goes. But before I do that, let me go back to the positive mass theorem. So, so in, this, in, this, um, in this work, the positive mass theorem is, not, is, is, there's nothing technically about the positive mass theorem which is used, but the statement of the theorem is used as an input into this, into this work. Right? So it, it, it turns out in order to get the estimates, you, you need the positive mass theorem. And while in the minimizing case, we were able to get by with positive mass theorem in low dimensions and in the conformally flat case, for this theorem, we can't get by with that. So we need the full positive mass theorem. So, um, so one of the skeletons in our closet comes out here, namely the fact that one, we don't really know the full positive mass theorem, or at least we haven't until recently. So, um, so as I said, both there, there, are two ba there are two proofs of the positive mass theorem. There's the minimal hypersurface argument Jiao and I did, and then there's the, um, the Dirac operator argument. Both of them work only in special cases in, in high dimensions. So the Dirac argument requires a spin assumption, topological assumption on the manifold, and ours um, requires low dimensions because of technical issues involving singularities of um, volume minimizing hypersurfaces. So, um, <clears throat> so let me just say that quite recently, um, uh, the minimal hypersurface approach, uh, th there's an announcement of g the extension of this to all dimensions by Christ and Locamp. Uh, but on the other hand, there's not a detailed paper yet. So um, um, they, they at least have announced that they can do this, uh, get around the singularity issues in high dimensions. And also, uh, th about three months ago, there's, a, there's some progress toward extending the Dirac operator approach. Um, so, uh, so as I said, it works for all dimensions, but requires the manifold to be spin. And, and now um, the idea, and, and so there's a, a paper which was posted in February, I think, by Degarato and Stern, who, who claimed to remove the spin assumption for dimension up to 11 for this, uh, 
for this theorem. And the basic idea is that um, um, if, the, if a manifold is not spin, you can remove some subcomplex of high codimension from the manifold so that outside the subcomplex it is spin. So what they try to do is solve the Dirac operator with, with, with particular asymptotic behavior on that subcomplex. On the other hand, it, it involves a lot of delicate analysis. So, so whether it will generalize to all dimensions is still not clear, I think. So, so that's one um, input which is important for. Why um, Because the um, the dimensions of these subcomplexes depend on the on the dimension of the ambient manifold, and so um, so in in the eleven dimensional case, there there are a very restricted set of possible singularities for the subcomplexes. That's the reason. Okay, let me, um, let me also make another digression, <coughs> which is a, a sort of parallel direction for this problem. Um, <coughs> you know, actually, the, uh, the Ricci flow, in a, in, in a, in a sense, is, is uh, a, a dynamical version of this uh, Yamabe variational problem that I've been talking about. And as everybody knows, there's been great progress on, on, the, uh, on the Ricci flow. So, so, uh, so geometric flows. Uh, are often a very good, a w good way to approach um, finding stationary points for uh, geometric variational problems. And, and for this problem, there's also a, a, a natural flow. It's called the Yamabe flow, which has been discussed for a long time, going back to at least 1980. And so uh, it looks like the following thing. So it's a conformal flow. So one considers dg dt uh, when evolves in a conformal class. And so basically, it's dg dt is minus the scalar curvature of g times g. g is an evolving metric. The little r there is the average scalar curvature, and it's put in there so that the volume remains constant in the flow. So it's a normalizing factor. Okay, so the flow, as defined here, preserves the volume of the initial metric. Uh, so one can specify the initial metric. This flow, this flow uh, moves through. Um, uh, unit volume or constant volume metrics in a conformal class, and one can hope that the uh, flow converges to stationary points. Um, however, this is not totally known. Um, what, it, what is known and has been known for a long time is that the flow uh, is smooth for all finite time. Okay, so it, in fact, this first first part is, is is known. So it's not so hard to prove that. There are no finite time singularities for the flow. But the question of whether the flow converges to a stationary point as uh, t goes to infinity is, is, is only known in special cases. In fact, the results here parallel the, um, the uh, variational results, which I described. So using the same kind of analysis that I had done in the, in the variational case uh, uh, already around in 1990, Rougang-Yeh uh, proved convergence of the flow in the locally conformally flat case. And again, quite recently, a year or two ago, um, uh, uh, Zeman Brembla did the case n less than or equal to 5. Again, it's the case where the mass can be defined. Um, uh, and also, he had some arguments in high dimensions, but I, I think those, uh, that is assuming uh, non vanishing of the vial tensor. He may be able to do that, but it's not in the final paper. And I also had a student who worked on this in three dimensions and, and developed a kind of different approach to, to solving that, which in some ways is. Is, is more more general. His name is Michael Grunenberg. And so again, the question of high dimensions, what happens to the flow, is also quite unknown as far as I, I'm aware. So it's quite possible that again in high dimensions one needs some version of this uh, bile vanishing theorem for the to, to prove convergence of the flow. So that's another um, interesting question. Um, okay, so I just have about five minutes left. So Maybe I can just um, let me just say a few words. There's there's one. Um, so so I mentioned that the uh, for the minimizing case, the um, uh, the mass uh, is used to in a kind of asymptotic calculation of energy. So one uses it to show that the the that the infimum of the energy can be gotten below some threshold level. Now, in, in, in for higher critical points, that's not quite the right thing to do. So the thing that replaces that is um, a kind of first variation identity. 
So this is a very important identity, which is used throughout this estimate in various ways. Um, and so this is a, a very general identity, which so it, it, it generalizes. So in the flat case, there's an old identity going back to the 60s called the Pohuzayev identity. And then it, it turns out that, that it has a natural geometric extension, which uh, generalization, which I'm describing here, which I had used already back in the 80s, and maybe it was known before. So, uh, but it's a very simple identity. Um, it, um, so it, it basically uses the following thing. So consider a manifold with boundary, or think of a domain in a, in a manifold, and consider a vector field on the domain. Okay, so if you take a vector field on the domain, you can ask whether the flow of the vector field preserves the metric, right? So if it does, then it's called a killing vector field. But more generally, you can ask whether it preserves the conformal class. And if it does, it's called a conformal killing field. And the conformal killing operator is uh, written here. So it's, it's a first order operator in X. So the first part is just the killing operator. And then the second part is just the trace. So I'm, I'm subtracting the trace part, uh, the killing operator. So the kernel of this, of this uh, operator is, is precisely consists of vector fields whose flows are biconformal transformations. And so, for example, a, an important case to consider here is a dilation in Rn. So <clears throat> if you take the vector field x ddx, this is the, the position vector, then it, the flow is by dilations in, in Rn. So that's, that's an example of a conformal killing field. On the other hand, if you take a typical metric, there won't even locally be any conformal killing fields, right? It's only if the, the metric has some conformal symmetry that there would be such killing fields. Um, and so the basic identity is the following. So given any vector field x, one can, says this really just uses Stokes theorem, integration by parts. So, so there's some constant here. This is just the vector field applied to the scalar curvature of the metric. So, so this vector field operates as a first order operator on the scalar curvature function. And these are interior terms, integral terms over the interior. The second term is the inner product of Tg, which is the trace-free Ricci tensor uh, of G. So it's the Ricci minus its trace. Uh, and then this, <coughs> that, this is dg of x, which is the conformal killing operator. Uh, and, then, and then there's a boundary term. So this boundary term is the trace-free Ricci tensor thought of as a, um, as a, um, as a symmetric uh, bilinear function on vector fields. And it's, it's integrated over the boundary. It's applied to the vector field x and the unit normal, the outward unit normal to the boundary. So, so <coughs> nu is the outward normal. Uh, and this, as I said, is just an identity. It uses the, uh, uh, it uses the twice contracted second Bianchi identity, that, uh, really. But it's, it's a complete, completely general. G is any metric, X is any vector field. Now, the important thing about this identity is that if I were dealing with a metric whose scalar curvature is constant or almost constant, then this term would be zero. And if I were dealing with a situation where I could find a vector field which is either uh, uh, a conformal symmetry, a, a conformal killing field, or very close to it, then the second term would be uh, either zero or small, right? So, so these these terms can be controlled if I know something about uh, sort of how close the metric is to being to being conformally flat. And this boundary term, it turns out, is very closely related to the mass. And so, in fact, you can actually use this identity to define the mass with a optimal asymptotics on a uh, so it's a very interesting identity. Um, and so, um, so this identity is used, is used uh, throughout the, um, the discussion. We we'll call it the basic identity. And so, um, well, I'm almost out of time, but um, let me just say that um, Maybe I'll just say in a few words what, what the idea is here. So, so the um, um, so the, the basic uh, so the the, bas the the general argument for um, for proving the theorem involves um, involves ruling out sort of arbitrary arbitrarily high energy blow up. So, so one can imagine a configuration where there's a, a core manifold there, and there are a bunch of bubbles which are attached. So one can, there are general theorems to prove that, in fact, when you have blow up, you can locate these bubbles. Okay? So what's important is to locate bubbles which are outermost bubbles. Okay? So it turns out bubbles like this, this one here, which have a neck here and a neck there, are perfectly okay. I mean, they're, they're solutions which look almost exactly like that. So, 
So, but on the other hand, if you look at an outermost bubble, th that bubble actually can't really be close to a solution because it's sort of unbalanced. So there's a, a kind of balancing idea involved here. So, uh, and the way that you do that balancing idea is to, is to apply the, uh, uh, the basic identity on a suitably chosen region where the boundary is on that neck. So that neck looks like a Schwarzschild solution, actually. You can, you can prove it. So there's a, there's, a, a little, there's a boundary term there that, that occurs. And if the interior terms are sufficiently small, you can rule out that kind of, that kind of stuff. So, so basically, using various kinds of scaling arguments and, and uh, clever choices, um, uh, you, can, you can prove that if you have blow up, this, this is whenever the mass is defined, whenever you can define the mass at points of blow up, you can prove that, in fact, uh, there can only be a finite number of points of blow up, and they're separated by a fixed distance. Now, to prove that there are no points of blow up, you have to use the positive mass there. Okay, so there's a, the global component in the end is the, the, um, <coughs> the positive mass. Ooh, I, guess, I guess my talk must be over. <laughs> um, so uh, so, uh, so, th th that's, so assuming, assuming that the mass can always be defined, that's very, very roughly the, you know, the, 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 the sketch of how the estimate goes. So it's a very indirect argument. You assume the solution's blowing up. You, you find these bubbles, and you prove that uh, that couldn't have happened, essentially, is that kind of idea. However, all of those arguments, those, those were the old arguments kind of back from the 80s, they all assume that, that you, can, you can define the mass, right? So there's, there's always this, this uh, they all use this, uh, this, uh, these, these mass-type terms. So, so the, the really, the new thing here is the, uh, the, the vial vanishing theorem. And what's used in that, and let me just say that I just, since I'm out of time. Um, so so to, the proof of the vial vanishing theorem, so that this is the theorem which shows that if you have a point of blow up, you in fact can define the mass in high dimensions. And basically the way that's done, I mean, it sounds a priori a little surprising because um, you know, you're only assuming locally that you have a, you have a point of blow up. But there's, a kind, there's an inductive way to do it. And, and um, so the idea is to show that you can you can improve the order of, if you have a point of blow up, you can improve the order of vanishing inductively till you get above this threshold, n minus 6 over 2. And um, um, the idea for doing that is to use the fact that you have a blowing up solution to prove certain L2 estimates on the Ricci tensor near the, near, near the blow up point. The proof of those L2 estimates, again, uses the basic identity. And so the basic identity is again used, but for not for not, but in a slightly different way. It's used to now take advantage of some of those interior terms to to get a to get a uh, an L2 decay estimate on the uh, on the uh, uh, on really on this on on this asymptotically flat metric. So so the basic idea is that if you have an asymptotically flat metric, and if you can prove that the uh, L2 norm of the Ricci tensor decays suitably fast, then that's equivalent to proving the vial tensor vanishes at the point to a sufficiently high order. So uh, I, uh, I'm out of time, so perhaps I'll stop here. Are there any questions? Very difficult to ask a question there. <laughs> okay, thank you very much, Rick, for a wonderful talk.